So I was, I was very disappointed, and I, I didn't understand why we weren't winning. I was too young to realize that libertarians were supposed to give up on politics. <laughs> I didn't realize that the official position of the uh, elite libertarian movement was that um, we were supposed to just focus on research and philosophical education, a long, hard slog of generations in hopes of a golden age two centuries hence. Uh, I didn't realize that. Uh, so I was, I was uh, foolish and rash enough to hope for freedom within my lifetime. And so I thought, how do we do this? And so I thought, well, um, how about we encourage libertarians to concentrate their efforts at the state level? Let's find a state that's relatively sympathetic to our ideals and, uh, and where we can really make a difference. And I sent it to, first to an old high school friend who is libertarian, um, Alistair Isaac. He's now a philosophy professor at University of Edinburgh, of all places. Um, and I said, hey, what do you think of this idea? And he said, oh, this is great. This is fantastic. You should go with this. So I then sent it to an online journal called The Libertarian Enterprise. Any of you uh, read The Libertarian Enterprise before? Any fans of TLE? <laughs> it's uh, L. Neil Smith was the publisher for a long time, the sci-fi writer. And um, you know, this was long before social media, so this was sort of the, the way you, you got things out there. And, uh, and the, the editor liked it so much, he said, you know, where do I sign up? And I said, okay, maybe this is, this is gonna be onto something. So once that article came out, I think it was uh, July 23, 2001, about 200 people emailed me in the next two weeks saying, hey, sign me up for your list, let's get this going, let's get this started. One of them was uh, Robert Vroman. Um, anyone here know Robert, Robert Vroman? He lives in St. Louis. He was actually at Porkfest last year, uh, which was the first time I'd seen him in person. And he hasn't been active in the Free State Project since then, but he was really instrumental at the beginning uh, getting our website started. He started this Yahoo Club. And we all kind of got together and had a conversation about how we were going to design the Free State Project. I'd come up with this number, let's get 20,000 signatures from people willing to move uh, to a single state. But beyond that, there was no other structure. Mark, you have a question? How did you come up with the number? The, the number, again, this was a, a foolish and rash decision. <laughs> I, the number was originally simply half the current Libertarian Party membership. That was, that was where the number came from. And then I did some research and I looked at um, what the Libertarian Party was able to raise, the National Party was able to raise in each election cycle, and it was about $5 million. And so then I went to a bunch of states and looked at how much um, federal and statewide elections cost in those states. And I found, actually, there are some states where those elections, uh, the total amount spent in those elections is less than $5 million. So I thought, oh, well, here's some proof that 20000 would make a, a big impact. But that's all that went into it. Um, it, it should have been a lower number, but that's what we, that's what we did. Uh, so we had a bunch of key decisions to make. We uh, had to come up with a logo, a tagline, statement of intent, participation guidelines. What I want to do is just read to you a few of the characteristic messages. I went through about 900 of the first messages on this Yahoo Club, which is still around. It's still it's got converged to a Yahoo group. You can go and see it and see all these old conversations, um, see what people were thinking back then. Uh, here's one from August 1, 2001, the very first day. Um, Johnny Magic 2001. I have no idea who this guy is. He was our resident anarcho-capitalist. And he said, uh, he responds to, to Robert's message, um, what do you think should be included? And he says, a right of secession. One of the main planks, if not the most talked about of this project, should be that if members of this state, of this free state wish to secede, the state shall back their secession with all its political and military clout. <laughs> <laughs> so that shows you what some people were thinking. And then... Uh, then I, I said something like, uh, I agree that everything, I responded to Robert, he said, no, we, we can't, can't back this with our military clout. And I said, I agree everything has to be electoral. Uh, if the feds send in the troops, I think we'd have no choice but to back down. Uh, let's see. August 1, 2001, someone named John Dave says, New Hampshire is the best option that I have read so far. <laughs> Very first day, someone comes up with New Hampshire. Median household income in New Hampshire, $42,000 versus national median, $37,000. Um, low level of poverty, high percentage of home ownership. 
Uh, and, and he gives a, a link to the census. Uh, Pack Rat 2 says, Hawaii is definitely a no-go. Their gun laws are worse than those in New York State. And Delaware and Rhode Island are quite restrictive too. Um, we had a, a member quit because I said something negative about the Confederacy. Uh, <laughs> so um, that started right away. Uh, <laughs> drama. Uh, <laughs> Robert Vroman, uh, August 8, 2001. I've decided using mottos that include the word freedom are redundant since we are, after all, undertaking the Free State Project. For that reason, I'm going to go ahead and use liberty in our lifetime as the motto unless someone voices well-reasoned opposition. Hey, it's even alliterative, sort of. So that's where that comes from. He, ca he gets all the credit for coming up with that, uh, that tagline. Uh, we did a bunch of polls. We put polls up on our website, and here are some of the examples of the poll questions. If the pledge were changed to a statement of intent and the other wording changed appropriately, people thought pledge sounds too uh, intense, uh, would you and your family be more likely, less likely, or as likely to sign the pledge? Uh, if the pledge statement became void every so often, say every three years, uh, would that make you and your family more likely, less likely, or as likely? That, the poll shot that one down, thank goodness. <laughs> uh, if the pledge allowed you, or statement allowed you to list states to which you would absolutely not move, would that make you and your family more likely, less likely, or as likely to sign it? People said, more likely, and so we ended up putting in, people could sign up, uh, we don't want to move, I don't want to move to this state, and uh, so long as there was at least one state that they were willing to move to, they could sign the statement of intent. Uh, in the bylaws, should we change members to read participants? Yeah, so actually we're all participants in the Free State Project, not members, for whatever that's worth. Um, let's see, what size of state should we consider in the vote? Under 2 million voters, under 1.2 million voters, under 800,000 voters, under 500,000 voters? Uh, in the end, we decided to set up a state research committee, and that committee said, let's look at all the states that are of reasonably low population and choose which ones we want to, to choose from. And in the end, uh, we set a cutoff of two million population, and then we looked at states under there and looked at um, how friendly they were to liberty. And ones that were not friendly to liberty, like Hawaii and Rhode Island, got uh, pulled out. And we ended up with 10 states that we, uh, that we held the vote on. Uh, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Delaware, uh, North and South Dakota, Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, and Alaska. Um, and there's a, there are a bunch of discussions about what, how we choose the state, what voting method we should use. Uh, Steve Cobb jumps in, and he jumps in on, uh, he, he was a member of the board of directors for a long time. He was actually moved to New Hampshire for a while. I think he's in Berlin, Germany now, though. Um, he, uh, he said, oh, the voting method you're using is, is terrible. You should, <laughs> you should choose a state uh, differently. And so we went kind of back and forth between different voting methods. And in the end, we allowed people to rank all 10 states. And then we chose the state that won a majority against every other state, right? Because you can take people's rankings and come up with matches, right? So New Hampshire versus Wyoming, New Hampshire versus Montana, and so on. And if there's a state that wins a majority against all of those, then we would choose that state. It's called the Condorcet method. And, uh, and fortunately, New Hampshire did. It, it defeated every other state um, by a, a convincing majority. I think Wyoming was the closest. It defeated every, every state but New Hampshire, but New Hampshire defeated uh, Wyoming something like 57 to 43%. Uh, let me see if there's anything else interesting in here. Oh, Patry Friedman jumps in. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> he jumps in here and, and, and says, um, uh, I'd be delighted to move to any state in the country, regardless of whether that could actually be taken over. But, <laughs> but I'm not going to commit to going somewhere just to have influence or make the laws a little nicer. Freedom is one of my passions, but realism is another. Um, this project sounds like a much more possible alternative than either founding a new country or converting all of this one. But while my interest is peaked, I remain unconvinced that even if you convince 20,000 libertarians to move to a state, they would be able to accomplish much. Okay, so, so you see Patry here already kind of leaning toward his founding new countries on the ocean 
uh, view, um, although I think he's become much more friendly to the Free State Project over time. Uh, let's see. Uh, some of the other people who jumped in really early, Mary Lou Seymour was, um, uh, was she lives in South Carolina, and she, she jumped in early and, and started helping out. Um, uh, Elizabeth McKinstry was our vice president. Uh, Deborah Ricketts was our treasurer. They, uh, we were sort of a triumvirate. Elizabeth, Deborah, and I were kind of the, <laughs> um, uh, the core uh, in that first couple of years. Deborah opted out of New Hampshire. She wasn't going to move east of the Mississippi. Uh, and so she's, I think she's in Arizona now. Uh, Elizabeth probably shouldn't have signed up because her husband was a college professor, and college professors just don't move to New Hampshire. <coughs> uh, <laughs> I'm the only one I know of who has. Uh, so her, hus you know, her husband uh, has a job, I think, in, in Georgia, and they just can't move. I grew up in Houston, which is west of the Mississippi. I, I wouldn't want to live in Houston. The climate's terrible. Um, Texas is not all that free. Uh, and they started to become a little freer. They finally legalized open carry with a permit, with a license, I think. But, um, um, but yeah, Texas is not all that free. Uh, I, I think there's a, a kind of view that you want to have lots of, lots of wide open spaces and not lots of people around you. I went to the, the, the Grand Western Conference in 2003, so during the state vote, there were two big uh, conferences. One was Escape to New Hampshire, held here at Rogers Campground in 2003. It was kind of the pre-Pork Fest, uh, what, what turned into Pork Fest. And then the other was the Grand Western Conference in Missoula, Montana. Elizabeth came to the Escape here, and I went to the one in, in Montana, appearance of neutrality. and. Uh, you know, I mean, there, there are some great people out there out west, but um, there are lots of disadvantages, too, including they're all landlocked, there's lots of federal land ownership, um, so those wide open spaces aren't necessarily free to settle, uh, much less water, so it's actually in some ways more difficult to homestead because um, the, the climate's so dry that you're not able to grow that much unless you have huge amounts of land, right? So there are lots of downsides, I think, to, uh, to being out west. And the biggest downside, and this is something that never came up in our discussions, but I think this absolutely makes a huge amount of difference, is that land area, small land area is good because we can all get together routinely, right? And so if you've moved to New Hampshire, you've noticed this, that I mean, we live out in Lebanon, out in the Upper Valley. It's about an hour and a half south of here. Um, you know, so we're kind of farther away from almost everyone. Uh, you're, you're out in Keene, and it's a similar situation. Um, but we routinely go to, to Manchester and Concord for things. It's an hour, hour and 15 minutes. Um, but that's, it's doable. And so we go there at least once a month for various events. In, in Montana, would you really drive? six hours, seven hours, 13 hours to get from Kalispell to Billings or whatever. I mean, we'd be totally isolated from each other and we wouldn't have that kind of community and that kind of social capital that we built up here. So that was something that we didn't even think about, but I think made a big difference. We, we did talk a little bit about influencing the political system and the fact that New Hampshire has the small state house districts and that discussion comes up even in, in August 2001 that that as a big advantage for New Hampshire. Uh, Rich Tommaso actually jumps in. Some of you may know Rich. How many of you know, know Rich Tommaso? He's Libertarian Party guy, pre-stater. Pre oh. Speaking he... of. <laughs> oh, hey, Rich. <laughs> Was that, w Rich, you were the first New Hampshire guy. I'm reading from, this, uh, from the Yahoo Club back in August 2001. Rich was the first New Hampshire guy to jump in on this discussion and talk about um, the advantages of New Hampshire and, and choosing, choosing that state. So... It was, uh, it was pretty wild. We, um, it started off very slowly, actually. We got our first 200 and then presented the Statement of Intent September 1st, 2001. Then 9-11 hit, and we had... <laughs> we were, first of all, out of the news. Second of all, the country became less libertarian for a while. Uh, and third, we even had some people quit and say, we're not libertarians anymore because America. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> And so we were kind of stuck at basically 200, 300 people who had signed up until August 2002 when Walter Williams wrote an article about us for WorldNet Daily. 
and that brought in another couple hundred, 300 people, and then the snowball started rolling from there. One of the things, one of the mistakes that we made was um, the fact that we had choosing the state at 5,000 signatures and uh, moving, triggering the move at 20,000 signatures. We're now very close to triggering the move, but it's been a long, hard slog since then. And the reason for that is that we were a huge media story while we were choosing a state. We dropped off the media radar after we chose a state until just recently, right? So we were, um, This American Life did a piece uh, following me around Vermont in, in February 2003. Uh, the New York Times reported on our, um, our state vote. In fact, I think it was on the front page of the New York Times when we announced uh, that New Hampshire had been chosen. Um, and then nothing until last year, Porkfest, we got uh, The Economist, we got The Washington Post, we, you know, we started to get big media again. Uh, but it's, it's been difficult. If we had stuck to the, actually, uh, the original idea was to wait till 20,000 to choose the state, something like that would have been much better. Um, another big mistake we made is during the state vote, uh, people were worried about vote fraud. I mean, the, the debate was so intense about which state we had to choose, we, we needed to choose. So there's, people were worried about vote fraud, so we, um, what we did was we, um, required everyone to get their ballots notarized and to present valid identification. <laughs> it's costly, right? And still, over 50% of the people who were eligible to vote participated. Uh, and, and the vote was certified by an independent company, even. Um, and the other mistake we made was we had someone in the project who was going to do the mailing, someone in Nevada. and. Uh, uh, so I set it up with him and he said, okay, so first class is going to cost you this much, but hey, you know what? You could do this third class and it would cost about a third as much. And I was like, oh, sure, why not? And he said, it'll take about two weeks. Well, a month later, some people had gotten their ballots, some had not. I mean, some people never got them. It's about done? Okay. Um, and, and even so, 50% of people participated. So. Um, really, if I want to impress on you one lesson, it's that um, it's a miracle we're here today. <laughs> it must have something to do with uh, the people who have, uh, who have made it happen, uh, you know, all you guys. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Varen, also a FSP early mover. <laughs> that's, that's probably the most important thing to say, I guess, is I'm an early mover. Um, a little bit earlier than Jason. Jason is the earliest... Um, uh, participant, I guess, right? You must be number one. Actually I'm, actually, I'm not, because it took me a few days to, to figure out if Mary, you want to... Okay, we need to sign this. Yeah, do you want to do your own project? Yeah, I was like yeah. maybe 12. Do you know who number one was? What's that? Do you know who number one was? We, we, we don't know that anymore because uh, things got kind of jumbled up in the database. So, yeah, I don't know. And the purge. Yeah. So, speaking of the purge, so I first heard about the Free State Project in 2002. And I uh, was living in California at the time, and my dad, who lived about a mile from us, I don't know if he regrets this or not, but he uh, gave me a copy of LP News, which had an advertisement for this thing, and he said, hey, you might be interested in this. There were about 1,200 participants at the time. By the way, I'm Varen Swearengen, and as Jason said, I'm an early mover. Um, I'll tell you a couple other quick fun things about my story, uh, which mostly is what I wanted to do, is tell stories, and uh, uh, Rich left. Uh, I was hoping Rich would tell me if one of my stories is apocryphal or not. I'll get to it in a couple minutes, but if you have to go, that's okay. Um, about the founding of the NHLA. So uh, anyhow, I, uh, I discovered the Free State Project in 2002. There were about 1,200 participants at the time and talked it over with my wife, uh, Edie, who's here with me. Uh, she and I decided to sign up. By that time, there were about 1,600 participants. And there's a couple of unique things about me. Um, one is that, as far as I know, I'm the only person to legitimately sign up for the Free State Project twice, Edie and I both, because we opted out of New Hampshire. Many people opted out and never moved. We opted out. We were kicked out because we opted out and signed up again and moved. Um, so that's kind of fun. In, uh, and uh, I co-authored the Idaho ballot paper. So there's the East versus West thing. And, and a bit of irony there, the other co-author was Kelton Baker, who was Jason's successor as president of the Free State Project. So two of the former presidents were Western state advocates, specifically Idaho. 
Uh, needless to say, we signed up again and moved. We came here, and this is the, uh, the NHLA story. Um, we came here in October, I guess it was, of 2003. My wife and I came about a month after the state vote to take a tour with our two oldest children. They were the only ones we had at the time. And uh, we had arranged to have lunch with some free staters. We'd really never met any except for Kelton, who happened to coincidentally live in the same town that we did in California. We walked into the lobby for this dinner and we saw some group of people sitting over in the corner and somebody said something about, oh, they're passing around paperwork to start this political organization. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. I didn't at the time have a really clear uh, vision for what happens when we get here. Our purpose for the tour was to d decide if we wanted to move to New Hampshire, and if so, where, and so on and so forth. And so that kind of planted the seeds that maybe there's a distinction between the Free State Project, that is this concept of let's all move to New Hampshire, and what we do as participants. And the NHLA was a vehicle, a vehicle, not the only one, obviously, a vehicle to live out your uh, statement of intent, that is, to exert the fullest practical effort towards the creation of a society in which the maximum role of government is the protection of individuals' rights to life, liberty, and property. And if you don't have that memorized verbatim, you should. So uh, it's on the website. That's what you signed. <laughs> so uh, the NHLA was one of the early um, organizations, I guess, started, started by natives. But maybe with that in mind that uh, this would be a place where free staters and non-free staters could, in a nonpartisan way, work in the political arena to achieve that end. Anyhow, so, so that kind of got the seeds planted that maybe as we are activists, we would do, um, do things not under the FSP umbrella. And, we, and the organization has since then tried to clarify that over and over and over again uh, with only modest success. Um, so I thought I'd tell a few stories from the early days of what it was like here in New Hampshire. Uh, fairly early on, there was a kind of a habit of helping people move in, and that has persisted to this day. We, we didn't really have a big party at the move-in. We hired a few uh, people to help unload boxes and whatnot, but another family, uh, another, another guy, Russell Canning, who some of you may know or know of, and uh, Edie and I moved uh, almost at exactly the same time, and we thought, you know, let's have a housewarming party, and, and maybe five people will show up, because that's all we thought knew about. I mean, we were like number 60 to move and everybody else was a long ways away. This is in Keene. And we were a little bit surprised to that point there had been 10 or 15 people uh, come in places like Manchester or Nashua. We had, I think, 60 people in our house and we all, we all looked around. Now this happens kind of more often now, but back then it was a total eye opener. And we looked around and we thought, wait a minute, this, this is real. This is not some um, internet scam, right? We've, we didn't pull up stakes in California and come here for nothing. There's actually people here that care about freedom. 50 or 60 people, now they didn't all live in Keene, obviously, uh, 50 or 60 people that would show up for something liberty-oriented in a town of 25,000. That does not happen anywhere else, and that was in 2004. Um, so that, that was uh, kind of a neat deal. Um, a couple other little stories that stand out in my mind as um, origin stories that maybe not a lot of people know about. There was a uh, Republican Liberty Caucus in New Hampshire charter meeting. It might have been in 2005, 2004 or 2005. And sometimes things just kind of happen not, not out of some big plan, but, but I was standing in a, about a four-person little circle having a conversation with a state rep by the name of Bob Guida. He later ran for Congress. And uh, Bob and I like each other because we both fly airplanes for a living, and that's kind of a fun thing to do. And uh, so I don't remember who the fourth person was, but Don Lincoln and myself and Bob were talking. And Don, I wish I was as smart as Don, but I'm not. Don had the presence of mind to say, what can we do to help you as a state rep, Bob's a very freedom-friendly guy, to promote freedom in the New Hampshire State House? And Bob said, look, I can't even read all the bills that come across the floor. How am I supposed to be able to figure out what's pro-liberty, what's anti-liberty? How important is it? You know, it's all noise. There's so much noise. And Don said, well, gee, would it help if we get kind of assembled some people and maybe tried to rate stuff? And he goes, yeah, man, that'd be great. So on the way home, we all drove together. On the way home, we're going, man, how are we going to do this? And what started was a Yahoo, a Yahoo list, the read the bills list. And that, that became a part of the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance. Again, it's not the Free State Project. We're now here. We're just going to do this stuff as, as uh, 
our own individual efforts. That ultimately led to what's now the gold standard. Um, so this little conversation, which could have been nothing, led to what now is by far the premier state level legis libertarian legislating rating legislator ra I mean the whole thing is just fantastic and no place else in America does that happen and it all started just with a little conversation at a meeting um, so the, the takeaway there is ask the right question if I'd been smart I would have asked but I didn't ask the right question and then be ready for the answer and ready to act on the answer um, some of the early pork fests, I've been to all the pork fests. There's less than 20 of us that have been to all of them. Uh, I, I flew out in 2004 to come to the first one and met a bunch of people. Again, this is another step from this is an online holy cow to uh, here's all these people. And there were like 300 people there maybe uh, here at Rogers Campground. And uh, the next year then I organized the 2005 pork fest and there were like 450 people and it grew and grew. And, and we do talks now here, before it was the bingo hall, that was plenty big enough. And, and there's vendors now that got started a little bit later on. But just getting to meet people, this is one of my big takeaways from Pork Fest. The, the thing I like most about this is just getting to meet people. So I know some of you and I don't know all of you, feel free to say hello um, anytime. And we get to know each other and that social aspect is very important because Eventually, the idea is we'll all live here. Some of us do already. Um, that said, we had had uh, speakers like uh, panelists and talks and things. And at some point, we thought, you know, maybe, maybe we should start another event. Uh, by that time, I had uh, joined the board of directors and done some organizing and, and uh, eventually became the president of the Free State Project. And so it fell to me to kind of maybe set some vision or ideas for here's what we can do to help move this thing along. And one of, one of the ideas, which was probably not really my idea, but I, I acted on it, was let's start another event. Let's do it in the winter time instead of the summertime, and let's make it very different from Pork Fest. So what grew out of that was the New Hampshire Liberty Forum. And uh, the first one was, was fairly significant. Ron Paul, uh, I'm sorry, John Stossel uh, headlined that. And that kind of, that, that did get a little bit of media coverage. Yeah, check, you should check out uh John Stossel's interview with Varen, because uh, Stossel yeah. was very impressed well, with Varen. Well, bo both of us, actually. <laughs> yeah. uh, Jason and I, um, part, of the, part of the deal with having Stossel come to New Hampshire and speak at the New Hampshire Liberty Forum was that he would interview for our video archives, Jason and myself. And uh, he really enjoyed that. I think he also enjoyed my introduction to him where I said something to the effect of um, climbing 20 feet up the stairs in a you know, six or seven hundred thousand pound machine with two hundred thousand pounds of jet fuel and pushing the throttles up on a hundred and eighty thousand pounds of thrust and going two hundred miles down the runway and taking off to thirty five thousand feet and going eight tenths of the speed of sound to halfway around the world where nobody speaks any English is an ordinary day at the office for me. But uh, introducing John Stossel is very special and he actually laughed pretty good at that. But uh, anyhow, that that New Hampshire Liberty Forum set the tone for a different style of event where there are more of these sort of talks and speakers and suits and ties and things like that. Uh, the, the following year brought in Ron Paul. How am I doing? Okay. Following year brought in Ron Paul and that uh, was right around the time shortly before he announced his campaign for president the first time around 2008. And something significant happened there uh, there were other candidates, of course, who ran in 2008. They would come to New Hampshire, as most of the candidates do, because of the first in the nation primary. They would have house meetings and, you know, try to get 50 people to show up, and they would fundraise, and, you know, if they could make $6,000, that's kind of big, really, really early on. Ron Paul came here, and I think it was maybe the Nashua Telegraph, or maybe it was the union leader, said he was treated like a rock star. That weekend that he was here, I think in his mind he made the decision to run for president. And it was in part because of the 700 or so people who showed up for his closing speech and the previous night, the house party, where a whole bunch of money was raised that way eclipsed what any other candidate had done. And the takeaway there is that there's, a, there's a, an acronym, a word, EMILY, uh, early money earns yeast uh, is something. So I should know the acronym. Next time I give this talk, I'll know the acronym. But anyways, the point being that uh, the, early, the early money, and I would, I would actually change it around early activism also, 
early activity is, is like yeast. It grows and amplifies the message. So we had an opportunity there, and it, and it took a little bit of, you know, identifying that, right? This could be big. This isn't just an off-the-beaten-path like nobody. This guy's been elected to Congress as a non-incumbent four times. He's served, I don't know, 20 or 30 years. And so we propelled him into the national limelight knowing that his message of liberty, he, he may or may not talk about the free, free State Project, but his message of liberty was going to connect with millions and millions of people, and that would be ultimately good for us because we could say, well, whatever the result of that is, you can come to New Hampshire and let's really amp it up here on a local level. Uh, so that was, a, that was a big takeaway there. A couple of things we did in the intervening years um, that I just want to highlight were a, a sub, kind of a subset, a sub pledge of the Free State Project. Uh, Jason mentioned earlier there's this 20,000 number and it's gone very slowly. Uh, people like myself, we were about mover number 60 or so. The first 100 showed up in the first uh, ye two years, year and a half, something like that. People like us were moving and we thought, you know, maybe, maybe there's other people who would agree to move with a smaller number and a shorter time frame. So we developed what was called the first 1,000 pledge and that was ultimately successful. In fact, Mark uh, played a key role in in uh, helping that along and several other people, the Osbournes and uh, I don't even know who all else, but we got on phones. We did a lot of work at the very end to get that pledge um, completed on the deadline and then uh, track the success of it. Uh, it, it wasn't a uh, hundred percent conversion rate. So I don't remember, you know, the number is 45. Yeah, it was about, it was about 40 percent who, uh, who signed and had not yet moved when they signed, yeah. but who went on to move in the next year. Yeah, so it wasn't 100% that actually moved, but that, that triggered a move, and a bunch of those people did eventually move and are now living here in New Hampshire. They are some of the 1,700 some odd who are here today. Um, let's see, what other, uh, that, was, that was all that was on my list. Uh, do you, do you uh, just a, uh, very briefly, do you remember when uh, we had lunch at uh, the first Liberty Forum and we were talking about the possibility of Ron Paul running for president? Yes. And I established, uh, Here's what I think would be a fantastic outcome for us if he did this. <laughs> Do you remember? That was the, go ahead. Well, I, I said, if, if Ron Paul can hit 5% in yeah. New Hampshire, that would be an astronomical total for a U.S. House representative running for, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. for, for president in New Hampshire. Yeah. And, uh, of course, he actually hit 8. Yeah. And then in 2012, he hit 23% here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that just goes to show you know, what, what we've been able to do here. Yeah, and, and a, lot of that, a lot of that is thanks to the efforts of Free State Project participants, not because the Free State Project does that work, but because those of us who move here plug in, in this case, with the Republican Party to help the Ron Paul campaign succeed to the extent that it did. And, and there is the little silver lining in his non-election, and that is that the pressure put on freedom due to presidents such as Barack Obama, uh, but even before him, has incentivized people who really care about freedom to look for an alternative. This is that alternative, and uh, what I see, though slower than we would all have liked, uh, is that it still stands as maybe the only viable, uh, proven, successful, to cer a certain extent, liberty movement in the world today. And uh, I'm glad that uh, Jason had the um, uh, foolish instinct to <laughs> start it and to make a lot of mistakes and that we were able to put band-aids on them. I certainly contributed to some of the mistakes along the way and I'm sure many others will follow in those unglorious footsteps but the neat, uh, the neat consequence of that is we're all here and we can learn how to sort of do liberty together, how to promote it, how to preserve it and protect it and uh, have a place for generations to come that will be much freer than we see today. So uh, I, wanna, I wanna open it up for Q&A because I imagine there's people that, that um, might wanna know something about the good old days and uh, Jason and I are happy to answer those questions. So step up to the microphone. Uh, thanks, uh, terrific talk. It's great to get insight onto the history. Um, I'm not sure uh, what number I am. I know I signed up before it was cho chose, you guys chose New Hampshire, and um, I don't even remember voting, because I was game to wherever you guys went, I, I was going. So how do I find out 
what number I am and, and make sure that's all done. And, this, and the uh, second question is, where do you live? And third question, where do you live? And fourth question is, GA aviation. You know, I'm a pilot. I don't fly commercially. Yeah. Um, you know, flying communities. I looked at the one at Soaring Lakes, Alsipi. What do you know about that? Okay. So yeah, so to get, um, certainly to get your mover number, you would contact Chris Lopez, and she could also possibly find at least a range of values for your signer number. So that's uh, chris.lopez at freestateproject.org, and she can look that up for you. C-H-R-I-S, yeah. I live in Lebanon, which is, um, you know, I, I teach at Dartmouth, so it's just right next to the town where Dartmouth is, Hanover. Uh, it's a pretty area, extremely left-wing. <laughs> we, may, we may be relocating to somewhere where our votes are not just thrown into a giant black hole. But. Yeah, I live in a black hole also, <laughs> in, uh, in Keene. It's probably as much of a black hole as Lebanon, yeah. just yeah. about. Um, and yeah, that's a good question. Why Keene? When we came here in 2003, we took a tour around the state. We're Flatlanders. We're from California. We don't know how to do. We actually lived in Kentucky for a while. We had a driveway like this, and we said we're never doing that again, especially not where it snows. And uh, we we wanted to have you know as economical of a situation as we could. So we looked at real estate prices, cost of living, all that. Drove around and kind of look and feel for the town. And what really drew us to Keene was the look and feel. It's a small town. Uh, but it has a lot of commerce being close to both Massachusetts and Vermont uh, with the no sales tax thing everybody drives over because they love taxes there, but they don't want to pay them themselves. So they come to Keene, and we have big box stores and stuff like that, and it's all flat. We can drive around. Because I'm gone half the time, my wife doesn't have to worry about, uh, you know, snow as much. We can find people to plow the driveway, et cetera, et cetera, and it's lower cost than uh, Manchester, Nashua, et cetera, or at least was at the time 10 uh, to 11 years ago. Uh, so that's why I live in Keene, doesn't have anything to do with politics because it's a black hole as far as that goes. And frankly, there's a lot that I actually like about Keene. The politics is not part of it. But um, the look and feel of the town is nice. I just There's a lot of people. We've made friends. Most of our sur social circle is outside of Free State Project circles. And it has become home. We've lived there longer as adults than anywhere else. And, and I think I might choose that again <laughs> if I had it to do all over again. If job location were not an issue, that definitely opens things up. Um, I think for us it would probably be Croydon, a town of 700 people, <laughs> where the school board is libertarian and they're trying to implement full school choice. That would be, it would be nice to have, uh, you know, our daughter be able to go to, uh, to a private school and our property taxes that we have to pay actually go to an education that we would want her to receive. Um, so that's definitely high on the list for us. I actually um, did a little um, statistical analysis just this week of uh, the most and least libertarian towns in, in New Hampshire. So if you, if you like, you can, uh, you can Google that. It's on, uh, on my blog, Pileus, P-I-L-E-U-S. Um, and you can, you can find that if you're interested. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily encourage everyone to move to the most libertarian towns in the state because there is such a thing as surplus votes as well, and, and plus there are all sorts of other considerations beyond politics, uh, but it might be just another useful bit of information to add to the arsenal. Yeah, there's an airport in Keene. <laughs> I fly 747s now, so I don't do a lot of GA flying. I do know the people that own the FBO in Keene, and uh, maybe, maybe after this is over, we can. I love talking airplanes, so uh, find me. Mark? Yeah, I run a, I don't know what to call it, a Facebook page called The Move Here Project, and we chronicle, I chronicle, um, different uh, projects throughout the years. I think the first one that I had was m the Minerva pro uh, Project, or the, Re the Republic of Minerva. This was back in the 70s, and some libertarians pumped some sand up out in uh, the ocean. They found a sandbar, and we're trying to make uh, countries, and then the King of Tonga comes with a 50 cal and says, we own this. And... Uh, like so, there's it's a it's a huge chronicle of failure. Um, all these move here projects are just failures, and uh, like the Free State Project stands as one of the very few successes that you can look at. And I, I mean, obviously there's been mistakes along the way, and everybody fails their way to success. But I mean, you know, we're here in this room, and they're not. Um, there have been many projects afterwards where people look at the Free State Project and says, well, that's a great idea. I should get people to move here. And so they try to get people to move to 
Yucca, some place called Yucca. I don't know where even where it is. And Wyoming, and uh, Austin, and uh, the Blue Ridge Liberty Project. Like, there's a whole bunch of them. And what I'm wondering is, is when you think about it, could you have designed this? You know, sitting back, what, 15 years later, could you have designed the Free State Project to have been more inclusive to these people that um, you know have created their other projects? For whatever it is, they're looking for something, whether it's magic land on the west side of the Mississippi River that's better somehow, or um, you know, I don't, I don't even know entirely what it is that they're looking for. Sometimes it's like. I can't leave here, so you should come see me. D could you redesign the project in that way? And you know, I have another question I'll after, ask after that. So uh, it reminds me of a message that uh, Mary Lou Seymour wrote in August 2001. She said, all these other projects have failed, and what's interesting about your project, and the reason why I'm signing up, she's like you know, 65 years old or something, and has been, been in the movement decades. She said, you're not asking for money. <laughs> <laughs> all these other guys ask for money first. Um, and maybe some of these Move Here projects aren't asking for money either, but I think maybe the best... But moving is even, I mean, it's, it's a yeah. more thorough investment than, than money. I mean, if you'd asked me for 500 bucks, that'd have been nothing compared to the losses I took on, you know, selling house, cars and houses and stuff to move. Yeah. Yeah, of course, now there are huge private advantages to moving to New Hampshire because there is such a big community here. It's, you've got, it's like having an insurance policy, basically, against all sorts of things because we help people who get into trouble uh, who've made their own contributions to the community. Um, plus, you get that kind of network for all sorts of uh, purposes. So there are actually immense private benefits to moving here. Um, how could we have been more inclusive? Maybe we could have waited to choose the state longer and so all these people could have felt like they had input into the process. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's, that's something I definitely regret. So um, there are sub free state project projects. The free town project comes to mind. It's sort of a, you know, it was a, a disaster, but nobody really remembers anymore. And that's really awesome. So people move to Grafton. <laughs> There's dozens of activists in Grafton and they have, they have a, a tremendous effect. They may actually be able to sort of brute force their town meeting, which is phenomenal. Um, there's a, I walked by a, a tent where a guy's like, move to Coas County, and that's the northernmost region of New Hampshire, and so he's got his sort of a free county project going on, and he made some good arguments. I wasn't really able to punch too many holes in them, and I do this, um, so <laughs> um, I'm just wondering, hmm, the Free State Project, is that still in your mind? Was, I mean, with all these other people coming with these sub things, would that have been a better idea? Could we have targeted, you know, different places? What are your thoughts on that? Well, it's happening already anyway, so I think that's fine. I think we're, have, we're seeing uh, beneficial competition among the different regions of New Hampshire. We've got the, you know, the North Country porcupines, the Lake Regions uh, porcupines, who are you know, at the, the sea coast and the, and the upper valley, um, as well as, of course, the big concentrations in, in uh, the kind of Merrimack Valley area and, and also in Keene. So, uh, so we're seeing this kind of fruitful competition. You need to get different flavors for the different porcupine groups. And we all have our own meetups. You know, come to Liberty Tuesday, last Tuesday of every month. In fact, we're having one right after Porkfest, if you're uh, still around. Um, and, uh, and, and each region has a, has a different flavor. So I think um, Upper Valley and Lakes and Seacoast are probably, you know, heavy on families. Merrimack Valley tends to attract a lot of the kind of younger people. Um, Keene is, has the distinctive kind of Free key. Whatever the hell that is. Everybody yeah. but me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Hey, whoa, whoa. Big <laughs> and Everybody, Mark. The and me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that, that, that'll lead me to another question there. I'll give up the mic. Um, right, like there's almost 2,000 people in state for the Free State Project. It's a phenomenal number. You had actually stated that as a number, as a goal um, for, you know, people in state, and that you thought that that was going to be something. Another thing that sort of came along with it that I don't think anybody was really looking for was in the area of competition, uh, there, there's a small percentage of people who sort of grate on each other, right? Like, so, you know, my uh, business partner, Ian, does the activism he does, which is phenomenally successful in attracting people to the state and phenomenally successful in making government bureaucrats hate free staters, right? Like, all at the same time, right? And um, then there's people that like that and dislike that and all kinds of uh, things that go on like that. Is there a way to have, um, you know, designed, like in, in looking back, what would you have done to have sort of addressed these issues as far as community goes? I mean, it seems like when you get a bunch of individuals together, they're gonna have different ideas and they're gonna do different stuff. 
There I think we've done as best as we could. And I think what Varen expressed about um, what the Free State Project does being different from what Free State Project participants do, we're just the bus to get people here and then you get involved however you want. Uh, obviously we kick people out for really extreme stuff, but um, you know, this, we're a diverse group. We disagree on tactics and, and, that, and that actually works. I mean, um, yeah, some free staters have, I think, uh, made, a, made a bad reputation for themselves because they've been so confrontational, but then others have made a good reputation for themselves. I mean, Carol McGuire is one of the most respected uh, members of the, uh, of the House of Representatives. Just one example among, among many, uh, Amanda Bolden. Um, you know, we could, we could go through a litany of people who've um, done great things in the community and been recognized for that. There's a recurring theme in the ones that are successful, in my opinion, uh, and that is be nice, be a decent, civil human being. And that's a message that I like to get out there as much as possible, so be nice. Yeah. All right, thanks. Uh, speaking of um, varieties of people and places and everything, are there any actual sociologists looking at the Free State Project or something like that? I know you work in an academic field, so yeah. I'm wondering if you know anybody who is even interested in the, the problem. So. Yeah, that's a, a good question. Um, I don't know of any academics studying the Free State Project. A lot of journalists have obviously been interested in reporting on it, but um, it's something I'd, I'd like to see. Uh, you know, um, m sort of before and after studies, before you move, after you move, you know, what changes about your life. I think we could all kind of come up with some generalizations. I mean, Different, it is, and in some ways it is a little bit of a, it's a, what, what social scientists call an exogenous shock. It's something that, that does affect people's lives in different ways. Um, you know, so for, for some people it might drive them in a new direction. Their life changes and goes in a new direction. For other people it may be, you know, they, they do basically what they were doing but in New Hampshire. So, um, I, you know, we could come up, I could be more specific about examples but I don't want to get gossipy, so. <laughs> I'm not a socialist. Soci I'm not a socialist. There, that's the answer to the question. Is that what you asked? Never mind. Last, last question. Okay. My uh, wife and I just moved here on Friday, so we're super excited to hear. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Uh, so it's been super interesting to hear about the history of the the Free State Project, but looking at the history and the kind of the trajectory of where the movement's going, is, is do you guys have a kind of a, even a date of when it statistically is gonna trigger and if there are any future plans with the, future, with the Free State Project? So, uh, I, think, I think we were looking at two years, right? To, to trigger the move? At the current rate. Yeah, at the current rate. I, I was on the board for about 10 years and just stepped down about six months ago. Um, Jason is now back on the board, so he has, let's say, more current information. But for many years, the consensus, there's not been any like decision or anything, but I think the consensus has been that the organization itself would at least go on for a five-year period of time after the uh, trigger in order to remind people, find people, encourage people, help them move, et cetera, et cetera. As far as anything beyond that, um, I think there's ideas, but not, um, maybe not a consensus. Is that your impression? Yeah, so uh, our, our overworked and appreciated uh, uh, President Carla and Treasurer Seamus both say, as soon as we trigger the move, we're quitting <laughs> because they're giving a lot and, uh, and they're ready to, to get it done. Um, but I think the organization will go on for five years after that just to help people move to the state. Obviously the welcome wagon is going to continue. We're going to continue uh, showcasing the state to, to new movers. Um, and if you want to, to learn a little more about um, uh, what exactly we can achieve depending on how many movers we actually get, uh, I'll be talking about that a little bit on Saturday on the commencement speech. So, Thank you all for coming. Don't forget to be nice. And we'll see you all this week. <laughs>